to uh, prevail upon President Johnson to say a word or two. Students and the Senator, I'm sure I speak for all this group, uh, although that is a presumption, uh, in saying that we feel in your debt for the time you give us, and the wisdom has flowed from your great experience. I think the outstanding feature about this man that's spoken this morning uh, is this, his total unselfishness and his dedication to his fellow man. I think the greatest handicap that any public servant can have is to think of himself. And a uh, great many of us have had to do that in public service to survive. Bill Benton didn't. He uh, told it as it was. He didn't survive long as a senator. But uh, his contributions will live after all of us have gone. Uh, we, the great president of the Republic of Texas once said that education is a guardian genius of our democracy. <coughs> it's the only dictator that free men will ever recognize. And it's the only ruler that free men will ever desire. That was Lamar. Uh, now, first week after I came into a very high office, I was at a dinner with the Prime Minister of Canada and many uh, distinguished cabinet officers and leaders uh, of uh, the world. And I was the last speaker and I had to observe in my opening statement that I sat there at the table with uh, four graduates from Oxford, three from Harvard, two from Princeton, two from Yale, and one from the San Marcos Teachers College. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess that if you look over the many weaknesses that prevailed during my administration, the greatest single handicap the president had was uh, the insufficiency of talented, competent, dedicated people to carry out his policies and be loyal to them. Uh, my creed was a very simple one. I thought if you could educate the people, and all the people, and every boy and girl born in this country could, there's a basic right, just like the Bill of Rights, was entitled to all the education that he or she could take or would take <clears throat> that that would preserve this democracy. I thought that good health to them was essential to a good education. I thought that their environment was a very important asset. I thought an absolutely uh, rigid requisite was equal justice to all of them. And uh, then there were many other things like consumers, problems, space, defense, our relations with other nations. Uh, but those are things were relatively uh, simple creed that I tried to promulgate in the form of statutes, laws of the land. Could you believe that it was more than 100 years ago when Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and it's still just a proclamation, it's not a fact. And I wonder if we're in an era to it being a fact today, and we were 10 years ago, I think so. And I wonder why and how that came about. Well, it might amaze you, but I think a black uh, boy who only finished elementary school. That was in the capital parlance known as a porter. Who drove my car back and forth from Texas after each session of Congress had more to do with bringing about a semblance of equal justice in this country than any president that, from Lincoln to Johnson. I, re I recounted my book, but it might be interesting to you to know that 
we had to come back to Texas every year after the congressional session ended. And as plane schedules got better, why well, Ms. Johnson and I would fly back to Texas with the children and it would be up to the black man that worked for us to drive our car and bring the cook and all the kitchen utensils, and <laughs> the baby uh, necessary pregnancies, et cetera. And one day he came in one evening after I finished the hectic session of the Senate and said, Senator, said I was leaving in the morning about daylight. Said, he got any other thing you want to tell me? And I said, anything else you want to say? And I said, well, are you going to take Beagle the dog? And he said, yes, sir, yes, sir. He said, do I have to take Beagle? And I said, well, of course, Beagle's a member of the family. We can't leave him here all summer when we're in Texas. Why, why don't you want to, don't you want to take Beagle with you? He said, yes, yeah, sir, sure, I, I, I guess so. Dejectedly, he went back to the kitchen where he'd been <coughs> washing dishes. And I said, Gene, come tell me why you don't want to take Beagle. He said, well, I said, uh, and these are his words. A Negro has enough trouble getting through the South without a damn dog. <laughs> 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 and that, for the first time, really aroused in my consciousness the terrible injustice that we whites had perpetrated in a nation where men are supposed to be created equal for almost uh, two centuries. He went, elaborated some. He said, uh, We drive all day, but when we want to go to the bathroom, just like you all do, we have to go out a side road and our women have to get behind the tree because we can't go in the filling station like you do. We get hungry and we got to eat just like you do, but uh, we have to go across the tracks to a grocery store and get some cheese and crackers because we can't go in the cafe. Or if some hamburger stand, we take a chance on being insulted, try to get by and we have to go around to the back wait till everybody else is served, <coughs> something to eat. So we drive hard all day long, comes 10, 11 o'clock, and Helen and I want to go to sleep. And said, we can't go in a motel or a hotel. We have to drive across the track and find some boating house way down there where they'll take us in for the night because we're not allowed in the hotels or motels in the country. I said, you're not allowed in any place, almost even across the tracks, you got a damn dog you got to take with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was chagrined at my insensitivity to my fellow man. And uh, out of that conversation, uh, when I got to be president, I urged in my first uh, statement that we start on a course of equal justice for fellow men my fellow men. And the first course essential to providing that justice was the simple right to permit them to vote. Permit everybody to vote in this country. Could you believe that for more than a century that the color of your skin determined your right to participate in democracy, not your right to fight wars, not your right to carry the burden of others, but your right to Make a decision affecting yourself and your country. That was determined by the color of your skin. Could you believe that the color of your skin could determine where you went to a bathroom, or where you ate, or where you slept, or where you had a home, or the house you lived in? I guess every female born, the first thing that they want after they reach maturity assume family responsibilities the roof over their own head. Uh, but they could never do this because if they owned one at all, it was in what they called the nigger part of town. No paved streets, no inside plumbing, no running water. I walked from the Driscoll Hotel on Christmas Day in 38. Within three blocks of the Driscoll Hotel, I found 115 people using one privy. 115 human beings drinking out of one water hydrant where they'd go with their 10 buckets and get it. 
one room containing nine human beings with a grandfather dying with tuberculosis and the baby just born in the same room with him on a pallet. And that's resulted in the first public housing act of this nation, President Roosevelt had. Now, on December the 10th and 11th, we're going to meet here with the leaders who are responsible for bringing about uh, a changed atmosphere in this country about who can vote and about who can eat and where and who can sleep and how and who can live in a home and so forth. Those are simple laws. Then they got the civil rights program of the 60s. There are a million papers that went into those bills. A million memos. A million conversations. The sum total add up to a million. <coughs> a million pleas with the president personally and by the gardener also. And we're going to open all those private memos. We're going to see what I said to Adam Clayton Powell and what he said to me and what I said to Martin Luther King and what he said to me and what I said to the Congress. And uh, I never was uh, suspected of being very dramatic or colorful or charismatic individual. But when I looked the Congress in the eye and said, we shall overcome, it was very significant to me that some of my dearest friends with whom I had associated through the years who thought I was just another crooked confederate sat on their hands and wouldn't applaud. But I'm very proud to say it was a matter of weeks until I signed the Civil Rights Bill <laughs> under the Abraham Lincoln statue in the rotunda of the capital of the United States. That's a great event for you if you're interested in not just in yourself, but in justice for your fellow man. If you're interested in making this a better and more perfect union, uh, if you're interested in doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, that's going to be an exciting meeting. We're going to have all the black leaders of that time come here and participate. We're going to have the man responsible for the Brown decision in 1954, the then Chief Justice Supreme Court, grand old man, American democracy, Republican. <laughs> Earl Warren was out whose uh, courage and <coughs> brain and effort and gifted political talents, we probably wouldn't have had any of these statutes. He will keynote the speech. Ralph Ellison, a noted uh, black writer. Roy Wilkins, head of the NAACP. Thurgood Marshall, the first black man to ever serve on the Supreme Court. Man who started out, I met him right here at the University of Texas because they wouldn't let Herman Sweat, a black boy, come to school. His people paid taxes always and they worked hard and went to church on Sunday. And they participated in the burdens of government just as the whites did, but the Herman Sweat couldn't come in this great university. And Thurgood Marshall came here and started a lawsuit, went to Supreme Court, permitted blacks in this country to go to state sports school. All that talent's going to be here. Uh, I would hope that it's a requisite, the highest priority, that each of you uh, come here and, and increase uh, uh, your uh, ability to meet the future that you face by uh, letting a little of this rub off on you and maybe a little of you rub off on it. My father used to have an old saying out in the hills. He said, you've got to brush yourself up against the grindstone of life and it'll give you polish that you can't get from Harvard or Yale. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you come here and brush up against the grindstone of what's going to happen in those two days, you may get a polish that these PhDs can't give you. Uh, <laughs> On the Equal Housing Act, I remember sitting in a room with Martin Luther King and Roy Wilkins and Whitney Young and all of the group, and they demanded the president issue a proclamation that said you could build a house any place you wanted to, black, white, brown. If you wanted to go out in Northwest Hills, uh, build a home next to the mayor and you had the money to do it, you could do it, and the president would issue that by proclamation. And I said, no, I won't do that. 
and 34 of the 35 black leaders insisted that I issue that proclamation. I said, no, I'm not a Hitler. I don't ever intend to be one. I am a product of the Congress, 12 years in the House, 12 years in the Senate, minor whip, minority leader, majority leader, vice president, and we don't do things by decrees in this country. We've got to do them by the consent of the government, the people themselves and their representatives in the Congress. Now, I will urge the Congress to pass an equal housing law, but I will not decree one with the stroke of the pen. Great disappointment to 34 of the 35 men in the room. <coughs> and I said, I know it'll take a, a decade, perhaps two decades. I first uh, passed the first civil rights bill in 85 years, in 1957, I guess it was. I had to go around the clock all night long for many, many nights to break a Southern filibuster to pass the first civil rights law. Senator Russell used to come to me about one or two o'clock in the morning and said, don't you think it's time we go to bed? And I'd say, are you going home? He said, yes, I think I'll call it day. I said, all right, I think I'll call it one too. I would go to my office and he'd go down to his little office and he'd immediately call back and say, have a quorum call. And that meant you had to, I had to, <laughs> as majority leader, deliver 51 men in 10 minutes. If I didn't, we didn't have a quorum and it would break, break the meeting up. But I delivered them all through the midnight hours, two, three, four o'clock, until we passed that bill. After many days and nights. So I, I, I believe that you've got to do things within the bounds of the Constitution, within the laws of the land, and most particularly in the spirit of the democratic way of life that we have. And I don't think one man ought to make the laws for the land by a stroke of the pen. But out of that group, one man spoke up, Clarence Mitchell. It's a revered name in our household. He's a lobbyist, a lobbyist for the NAACP for 40 years said many abusive things about me, good many of them justified. <laughs> but uh, he said the president's right. The country will hardly take a law to that effect and they'll never take a proclamation. And what good's a piece of paper if you can't get results? And this man believes he's a can-do man and he believes in getting results. Now, I'll never get it in his presidency, but we'll get it and when he, we get it, it'll be here to stay. So he supported it. A few days later, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and the next morning I called the leadership down, and the next week we passed equal housing in the United States. It's the law of the land. It's not the proclamation. It's got the signatures of the majority of the House and the majority of the Senate. And despite all the things you've heard and all the changes that are taking place, and I'm one who encourages change and believes in it and don't think change is... I don't believe change is our enemy. I think status quo is. But uh, notwithstanding that, they haven't repealed a single one of those laws. Franklin Roosevelt put 120 major basic piece of legislation on the statute books in his four terms as president. But during this changing period of the 60s, in five years, we put more than 400. I've just listed five or six in the civil rights field. There's 60 education measures. There are 40 health measures. There are dozens of environment measures and consumer measures, and, uh, et cetera. I won't go into it. Uh, now, all during that period, the one thing that I felt, I felt inadequate in many fields. No man can occupy uh, that majestic uh, uh, post of leadership in this country without being humble and without feeling inadequate. But the greatest inadequacy I felt was my ability to do what, to know what was right. I just didn't have the intelligence or the staff to make judgments that I was always positive would result in the right. 
A president's greatest job is not wanting to do what's right. I believe every man holds that job, wants to do what's right. He's reached the ultimate. After all, why does he want to leave to his, leave to his children, his grandchildren, the heritage that he was a bum and he did what was wrong? He wants to know, wants to do what's right if he can only know what's right. But the things that come to him are balanced just about like that. And you put them on scales and it's pretty difficult to detect which one goes up and down. And uh, if they're not questions like that, they shouldn't come to him. Usually they're settled by minor people down the line, the bureaucracy. So his big job is not doing what's right, but knowing what's right. <coughs> and in this frightening age in which we live, uh, it's pretty difficult to know what's right. And if you're going to make a decent approach to it, you've got to have the most competent technicians around you. And I never knew of an institution and I was associated with education a good part of my life. I was with NYA for three wonderful years of my life. Uh, I uh, spoke at a job corp opening where I had a camp open, Camp Gary at San Marcos, and the mayor presided, and the congressman spoke, and the governor followed through, and the circuit ju ju judge spoke, and Sergeant Shriver of Yale who graduated from Yale, head of poverty, spoke, job corps program, and I spoke. And I didn't have a speech. And while they were talking, I was thinking about what I was going to say, and I just got up and said this. What a wonderful program the NYA was, because the mayor was one of the first men on the NYA job when I was director. And the congressman, Congressman Pickle, was an NYA student. And John Conley, I gave him a $12 a month NYA job at the University of Texas. He was governor of the state. And Homer Thornberry is on the circuit court, and he had $14 a month working in the sheriff's office. Sergeant Shriver went through Yale as a poor boy before he met to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> before he was married uh, on an NYA scholarship and the president of the United States came out of that program. And what more lasting testament could be given to uh, the uh, results of a youth, uh, of faith in youth that men like Harry Hopkins and Franklin Roosevelt had. Uh, so when I came home, I thought that uh, the greatest contribution we could make to preserving freedom in our land, a society that would give us uh, the fruits of uh, uh, of life uh, as we should have them would be to prepare and equip people to serve their fellow man. And that's what public affairs is, and that's what it means. And my mother told me as a little boy, I want you to be a preacher or a teacher or a public servant. Many, many times I wondered when I was in a Mexican schoolroom uh, down on the border teaching. Uh, poor Mexican children who couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak Spanish, why my mother wanted me to be a teacher. <laughs> and when I went to, <coughs> I was corralled into some of the Brush Arbor uh, revivals, I wondered why she wanted me to be a preacher. Uh, but when I came home on that last night to, from Washington on January the 20th, 69, I never had any doubt about why she wanted me to be a public servant because the greatest known satisfaction to human beings is that that comes from knowing, and if you are the only one that knows it, it's there and that's what's important, that you've made life more just and more equal and more opportune for your fellow man. And uh, that's what this school is all about. Thank you very much. never speak long and I'm doing it against orders now but I won't tell you a little story it's a little off color <laughs> <laughs>
I, I want to appeal to all of you to come to this conference. You have to cut your classes, participate in it, be a part of it. Have it said, be able to say in three decades from now, I was there. We helped to overcome December the 10th and 11th. I want you to be my consultant. That's one thing I want to ask of you. I put a lot into this school, a lot you don't know about. I got a blood scattered all over the state capitol. <laughs> Someone brought a big black bulldog into the neighborhood. And pretty soon the whole neighborhood was flourishing with the little black dogs. And uh, very much to the distress of the mothers, the ladies of the neighborhood just had dogs on every porch. And they decided to do something about it and they consulted one of the uh, veterinarians, took the dog down, had him operated on. And there was a relative calm in the uh, community for period of two or three years and then pretty soon uh, the dog started flowering again puppies were seen waddling down the sidewalk <laughs> and the ladies aid society met and they were discussing it and one uh, senior maternalistic old lady said uh, well i'll tell you what's happened it's that damn black bud bulldog that's what's <laughs> causing it all and the other lady observed well i thought we had him operated on said i know it but he's acting as a consultant <laughs> so i want all of you to act as my consultant and i want to get all the little uh, folks that we can to fill that auditorium when they come here and fill it, fill it with curiosity and with interest and with dedication. And this is a nucleus. So go out and get your boyfriend or your girlfriend or uh, your banker and bring them in. <laughs>